My name is Lee Elan. I'm the Chief of Planning at the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation. And I was excited to put this panel together for several reasons. First of all, our office uses GIS, uses data from um, city agencies, also from the state and the feds, and in appreciation of my colleagues who publish this data and the great work that they're doing, uh, thought it'd be a good way to showcase that and to uh, find out what they're working on for this year that we might incorporate into our work. Um, also, we're aware of the passage of Local Law 42 of 2022, which has some uh, exciting uh, geospatial implications. The city is going to be putting in a geospatial, appointing a geospatial um, officer and doing some more interagency coordination. That's very new, but uh, that was on my mind. And uh, it's always good to get together and share data and knowing what we're doing. So a little bit about the format today. We've I've asked uh, five colleagues from different agencies to make short presentations, kind of lightning talk, five to 10 minute presentations. Some people have slides, some people don't. Um, about what they and their offices are doing this year. We may not need the full 90 minutes, but it's a nice uh, relaxed way to get the talks in and to make sure that we have time for questions. And uh, the slides that we have, we will uh, offer to share with everybody who's here um, afterwards. So if you signed up, we'll get your email addresses and we'll share the slides afterwards. Uh, so let me introduce the panelists. Um, I introduced myself. The first person to speak will be Jin Wen. She's Senior Vice President for Multimedia and Geospatial Information Service Unit at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And she is also the president of Gizmo, a fine organization that everybody should join, and I'm sure she will tell you about. Uh, next, we'll have Josh Friedman who's the executive director of GIS for New York City Emergency Management. Then we'll hear from Matt Crosswell, who's the GIS team lead and the open data coordinator for the New York City Department of City Planning. Next will be Matthew Montesano, the director of data communication at the Bureau of Environmental Surveillance and Policy at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And then we'll wrap it up with Tom Swanson, the Executive Director of Citywide GIS at New York City's Office of Technology and Innovation, OTI, which is formerly Do It. And Tom recently joined us from Philadelphia where he was the Deputy Chief Information Officer. All right, so um, a little bit about my office and how we use GIS data. We have an application called SPEED, the Searchable Property Environmental E-Database. And my office, the bread and butter of what we do is oversee cleanup programs, mainly for private sector sites when people want to uh, do environmental cleanup on a property before they build a new building, they will come to us either because they have to or because they want to because of incentives or their lender uh, requires it. And they need to do environmental investigations and cleanup. And so we have a lot of data about our work on uh, the speed application. And plus, as I said, information from the state and from other city agencies. And uh, you can do terrific things like find e-designations and completed uh, cleanups and state projects. Uh, this is just a screenshot from Speed. I encourage you to take a look at it. There's a contact us button and uh, please look at it. It gives a lot of environmental data about sites in New York City. On Speed, I just wanna highlight our open data um, offerings. So we, of course, have the cleanup sites that are in our program. 
We also run the New York City Clean Soil Bank. In the course of doing our work, there are excavations not only of contaminated soil, but also of pristine native sediment. And we want to reuse that resource. So we show the generating and receiving sites. And also on our website, you can find uh, information about that. We reuse it at other sites in our program, at city capital projects and uh, sites like community gardens that need um, clean soil. Uh, we do a lot of community engagement work and uh, supporting nonprofits that are looking to have an influence and shape how sites in their neighborhood are developed. So sometimes uh, they have control either of a community garden or they're doing planning in an area that they're concerned about. We offer grants around that. And there are also some state grants that uh, help nonprofits deal with areas where there are clusters of brownfields or potentially contaminated sites. We have a map of those on our speed portal. And then also um, we have some historic land use information. We don't have the maps. We didn't have the license to do that, but we had scraped data from um, a few thousand sites that were industrially zoned and vacant. And um, for the sites we had data, we have made that available also. And that's in our speed portal, but it's also available on open data. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Jin to talk a little about EDC and Gizmo and how she uses geospatial data. Thank you, Lee. That's um, your product. The is always speed is always fun. I absolutely uh, also shine light on and encourage everyone to take a look at that project, uh, the website. So, okay, again, thank you, Lee, for the introduction. My name is Jin Wen, and I'm the lead for the Multimedia GIS Unit, or MGIS, at NYC EDC. And please, uh, please check out uh, EDC's work at edc.nyc. And in, in a brief way to describe the, the purpose of EDC is really we want to get good jobs and to so we can uh, establish strong neighborhoods. Who doesn't want that? But, um, but back to the purpose of this particular panel, I believe my share this afternoon is a bit different from the rest of the, my esteemed panel. I hope not to disappoint um, because I don't really have much slides, but whereas they're all data providers of the highest level, I am a data consumer on behalf of EDC. Taking a moment to thank the agencies for the amazing job they do, I truly cannot do my job without your products. I believe Lee invited me here to be the voice of the data consumers in the audience and provide the data providers a look at how their product is leveraged. So let's start with what is my job. So I'll save the multimedia talk for another day, but in, in short, the MGIS uh, unit team supports the corporation. Sorry, just adjust my piece here. By being data librarians, data analysts, system analysts, and process analysts. It was quite satisfying to be called an intrapreneur lately. This seems to be a term from the investment world, but I think it is a role every organization should consider having one or two. So my understanding is an intrapreneur, intrapreneur is an employee who is asked, tasked to, with developing innovation, innovative ideas or projects within the company. So as an intrapreneur, our job is to be aware of the needs across the organization. Uh, a few be best practices I lean on are biannual annual check-ins with transactional departments, set standards for deliverables by projects with project managers. Examples I can easily give, maybe some of you have used our uh, or collaborated with us on the, the, on the bathymetry surveys for our waterfront survey program. And we provide sandbox for our super users to test out their proof of concept so we can further work together to fine tune and polish their products. And on the subject of on the subject of users, okay. we just like in school, we need to differentiate the skill sets and time commitments of, of, of our different of our different colleagues and users in within the organization, from GIS professionals to can only use Google Map, and you know you have a few of those in every organization. 
So I also want to say tool is an overused term these days, I'm afraid. I think tool makes folks think it will answer all questions, like that was easy button from Staples ad a few years way back. So what we do and uh, help our users kind of figure out what how to use the products and how to use the data is we ask what do we provide our examples and case studies for our colleagues so they can start to put their questions in context and find the, the appropriate outcome. I think templates are great for guidance. Above all, knowing the organization's business pillars and know how to cross-pollinate is crucial. Uh, crucial. So with that, I am gonna yield more time because I know we have several live demos, but I'm here, um, I'm here for questions at the end. But, but thank you, Lee, for giving me a moment to plug Gizmo. Gizmo has been around for 30, 30 plus years, and it is an organization that uh, started uh, with Jack Agumba, Jack Agumba, who was uh, with DOF and it's his career is with the city. And it is a space where um, uh, GIS professionals come together, talk about technology, we talk about data, and really talk about how to uh, collaborate all year round. If you want to have a moment, you can check out gizmonyc.org. Uh, With that, I thank you. Back to you, Lee. Great. Uh, thanks, Jin. And when we get to questions at the end, maybe if there are any upcoming events that you want to plug, uh, please take that opportunity. Uh, but for right now, I want to turn it to Josh at Emergency Management, and um, I can advance your slides if you want to give me the prompts to do so, and I'll turn it over to you. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have a whole bunch of slides, but I'll try and stay nimble. Um, so I'm Josh. I run the GIS team here at Emergency Management. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about two of the public-facing efforts that we have in the geospatial world, but just briefly before I dive in. For those who are not familiar, um, Emergency Management, we are the coordinating agency for New York City. That's how we're written up under the city charter. You see here, here sort of the core um, pillars of our mission is really preparing and planning for emergencies, helping support and coordinate response to those emergencies when they do occur, and collecting and disseminating information both for decision makers here at City Hall and for the public as well. Um, next slide. Um, we help coordinate and respond to any number of emergencies. We are very weather focused since that's not really a core um, competency of, of other agencies necessarily. And we have, you know, what seem like a million and one plans. Um, geospatial data is really crit critical um, for providing what we call situational awareness. It's our, our favorite buzzword. So kind of knowing what and where is, is happening um, to help us target a response. Um, let's go to that next slide. So the first of two things I just want to hit on is our hurricane evacuation zone project. I'm fudging the calendar here a little bit. The uh, updated um, data set was released about nine months ago, but since the update cycle is seven to 10 years uh, and we're still within a year, I'm calling this current and wanted to draw a little bit of attention to it. Um, so just a few um, notes, hurricane evacuation zones. When we talk about these, these are zones that we draw for evacuating New York City residents for life safety reasons from the threat of storm surge only. So I just wanna mention that because there is a lot of confusion with flood zones and FEMA's maps, which have to do with insurance for buildings and look at um, probability of occurrence for certain things. We don't take those um, type of factors into account. Um, two other terms which you'll hear me use for this slosh refers to the National Weather Service's storm surge model. And that's the underlying data that we use to create evacuation zones. And then above ground level or inundation, that's the term we use in the emergency management world. This is what we are concerned with, right? For any given location in the city, how much water might be on the sidewalk, for, for example. Next slide. Um, so we'll take a brief history of kind of how we got to where we are now. Um, the modern era, if you were, of our evacuation zones in New York City started in 2003. Um, we had zones A, B, and C. You may remember those from our hurricanes, Irene and Sandy. Um, in 2010, actually prior to Sandy, an updated flash model was released. And then as it happened after Sandy, we released the new set of zones that look basically look what they continue to look like, zones one through six. And as I mentioned, about a seven to 10 year cycle in 2020, the 
Hurricane Center, part of the National Weather Service, released a new, what they referred to as a slosh basin. So they did new modeling for our area, it's now called Northeast One. Um, and last year, we released some updated zones. Uh, next slide. So there's just a quick look to kind of paint the picture of where we've gone, right? This was pre-2013. You can see a whole chunk of the city, and this remains basically similar, is covered by only three zones. And if you look at the population split there, what we realized and learned the lesson is it doesn't give us much flexibility, right? For Irene and Sandy, we actually had to go about adding to zone A on the fly. And if we had slightly more severe events, we really didn't have any flexibility. Um, next slide. So we switched to what was at the time very new, and Miami has done a lot of this work over the years since they're very experienced with hurricanes and they get hit from all bearings on the clock. But we switched, simply put, and I can speak for hours on this, so if people want more detail, let me know, to bearing-based zones. And this is the image that I use to paint the picture. A, B, and C were basically just worst case by category. If you look here, the pinkish color versus the dark blue, these are both category four hurricanes hitting the New York City area, traveling forward at 60 miles an hour. One is northeast, one is west, west northwest. And so this really, to me, paints the picture, right? We get hit by a Cat 4 storm. If we have to evacuate for the worst case of any Category 4, we got to get everyone in the blue area, which you can see would be a major over-evacuation for a storm only impacting, at the worst case, the pink area. Next slide. So we do a lot of work uh, about nine years ago and come up with this, um, zones one through six. As you can see, based on the population matrix, this is the older population, we have a lot more flexibility, right? For each zone, the numbers are still very large, but we can target different hazards a little bit more precisely. Next slide. So just a few notes, as I mentioned, this slosh basin that was released, all the slosh grids look kind of like fans. We are at the center of the grid, just like New York is at the center of the universe. Um, I say just with a, with a wink as a native New Yorker, um, basically higher resolution, a lot more uh, modeled storms in there, better understanding of how water flows over urban terrain and, and through our areas. So we think this is a better model to work with. Next slide. And so here I have two slides sort of showing how we put these things together, right? What we're doing, we have, and I can get into details at another time, you know, well over a hundred different scenarios. We're looking for things that look alike, basically. So here you have a category four storm, a category one storm based on the parameters. They cover very similar areas. So those scenarios would get grouped together into a zone. Next slide. And you can sort of step through this one if you would in three or four clicks. So we're basically going to get a few scenarios that fit together. You can keep clicking through um, and get to a zone. There you go. And, and we will merge all those together into a single zone. Next slide. From there, we have all these jagged areas. The simplest way to describe our decision rules is if water is touching a building, potentially we draw that block into the zone for the corresponding data set. So it gives us a conservative approach. Next slide. And then some areas of the city, and there's a lot more um, detail that goes into it, but City Island and Rockaways, areas we highlight, they may not all be inundated by zone one, but because of access and other life safety concerns, we put them into zone one. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And so here we go. This is what was released last year. These are the current zones that we expect to be in effect for a number of years. You see, they look fairly similar. There are a few, you know, at the neighborhood level, there are some significant differences, but overall they look fairly similar. Next slide. Um, it's the same look, but just we like to highlight, this is really what we draw the zones for and what we evacuate for. So this is really the threat that's being represented um, behind this data. Next slide. So in terms of pushing this information out, this is, you know, we were also kind of at the forefront of this, I think, as a city, we put this data up, and this is a screenshot of a hurricane evacuation zone finder. It's an application hosted by Do It that we provide the data for. So this is up all year round. Residents can access it directly. They can call 311. We really promote this um, as a resource. Next slide. Um, and here are a few places where you can go directly to get some of this information. Um, I would say for, you know, 
please look at the at the zone finder and, and let your friends and colleagues know as well. Um, the evacuation zones, because that's based on city planning data, it is available in open data. I think the most reliable the way way to get the current any quarterly updates would be from city planning. Um, and soon we've had a lot going on with transitions at the end and the beginning of the year, but we will have up before storm season the underlying data um, that we use to create the zones. All right, next slide. Um, so here I'm just going to walk through very quickly, and this I would encourage folks to go because the best um, way to experience the hazard mitigation plan, as you see, is to interact with it live. Um, this is probably the first really major, except for something like the zone finder, the major public facing effort for us at the emergency management GIS team. We tend to provide services for our colleagues in the city more, um, as well as our hazard mitigation team. So the hazard mitigation plan, something the city has to update every five years in order to be eligible for reimbursement following any number of disasters. Um, I started supporting this plan about 13 years ago. It was a giant 700 page paperweight when it was done. And so our mitigation team here put a ton of work last time into transforming this into a web-based product. Next slide. And so just quickly again, to, to get the, the meat of this, you gotta go play around with it yourself. Um, but just to tease a little bit, one of the tools we put out there are called community risk assessment dashboards. And these are the natural hazards that, um, that they cover. Next slide. And the idea here is you can pick a neighborhood or a community district, pick one of these hazards and get information that is customized for your area based on the particular hazard. And all this is coming served publicly from our ArcGIS Online organization and then embedded uh, in the site here. Next slide. And then the last bit here, and also among the many tools that's up on the hazard mitigation site is a mitigus set of uh, information about the city's mitigation actions. So these are from many dozens of city agencies and entities. These are projects that are going on to help promote uh, mitigation and resilience throughout the city. Um, so if you wanna click through the next two slides, there's a map here. You can see a dashboard um, that you can interact with as well to get progress. And then on the next slide, um, folks can also go and download a database. Um, and this gets updated periodically um, so that the public can track uh, projects that are going on throughout the city. Next and last slide. Um, and I've included again some links. These will be shared. These are all directly to um, through the hazard mitigation website where a lot of the data can be accessed. Um, similarly with my last, we're, um, there is some mitigation actions data up on open data. If you wanna get an example of what's there, um, that's a little bit dated and we'll be looking to um, refine our update process and, and get new data up there um, in the near future. And that's all I have, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Josh. That was really informative and I certainly made some notes on some new tools I'm gonna be checking out uh, after this. Uh, so let's now turn uh, to, oh, do I have these in the wrong order? Um, to Matt Montesano at the uh, Department of Health. Uh, are you there on the screen? And uh, if you want me to advance the slides or let me know when you want to um, jump in with your demo, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um... So hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining today. My name is Matthew Montesano, and I'm the Director of Data Communication in the Department of Health's Bureau of Environmental Surveillance and Policy. Uh, now, unlike some of the other speakers here today, I don't have a GIS background. Um, and my team works to publish data so that it's useful for others. So as we do that, it's helpful for me to learn what people are interested in accessing and using. Now, if you all are geographers or data scientists, or if you're interested in public data sources and all the ways that those things can shed a light on the city around us, then at some point you might be interested in health data. So I'm here to tell you about ways to access neighborhood level health data and a few things you should be aware of when it comes to health data. Um, and as I just said too, I'm also here to listen and learn from you. Lee, next slide, please. So the health department has a host of data. We conduct surveys, we track records of births and deaths through vital statistics. Uh, we conduct what's called disease surveillance, meaning we collect, analyze, and publish data from hospitals and laboratories. 
We also publish data on various operational, inspectional, administrative processes. It's a lot. So accordingly, we have a variety of data tools to provide access to some of these data. And you can find them on the Department of, Wealth, uh, Department of Health's website uh, under data here. Next slide, please, Lee. Now, I lead work on uh, one of these products, a website called the Environment and Health Data Portal. It was part of a program called the Environment and Public, Environmental Public Health Tracking, uh, which is funded by a CDC initiative. And our goals with this program are to monitor how environments and environmental changes affect health. There are, our goals are also to make our data easy to access, understand, and use. And in doing so, let these data inform policy and practice. And what that means basically is that we want to build something that's a useful tool for you, for people like you. A couple of things that are unique about this site, uh, we're not publishing an exhaustive library of data, rather it's sort of a curated volume of data. Uh, it's data from many sources also, not just health department data. And we're publishing data that are designed to show these connections between environment and health. So our goal here is a product that's descriptive rather than, than exhaustive. Next slide, please, Lee. Thanks. So I'm actually, uh, at this point, I'm going to um, grab control and just offer a quick look uh, through our site and a few different content types that we have. Um, so this is our environment and health data portal. Uh, we have a few different content types, as I mentioned. We've got our data explorer, neighborhood reports, and data stories. I'm just going to give a quick blast through to give you all some eyes into this. So first of all, we have our data explorer, and this lets you browse data sets and get to visualization endpoints of all of these different data sets. So for example, I'm going to go into asthma, and I'm going to take a look at uh, hospitalizations for asthma among children age 15 to 17. It's going to take a minute to load, um, but you can see uh, you've got access to uh, this data set. Um, information is available citywide by borough and at the neighborhood level. We've got uh, trend data, maps, and connections with other data sets. Um, so this is one indicator, and we have some 250 indicators across 50 topics or domains that you can explore. Secondly, going back home, we have this uh, area here called the neighborhood reports. And with these, we put together different data sets that help comprehensively describe a topic and let you view data for your neighborhood and how it compares to other neighborhoods. So for example, I'm gonna take a look at climate and health, and I'm gonna go into uh, my neighborhood, which is Flatbush. Uh, and we can see a variety of different uh, indicators here, data sets showing me uh, how my neighborhood compares to citywide average. Um, and I can click into these uh, and get some more data on any one of these data sets. And uh, our last content type uh, are these data stories over here. Um, these are narratives about some of our data sets. They help provide a little bit more explanation and context. I'm a big believer that data don't speak for themselves that people who have a deep understanding of the topic, of the data collection, the analysis methods, these people have crucial insight into the data. So we try and provide some of that insight and some perspective as a support to people who would be using these data down the line. So the long story short here uh, is that on this site, there's both a lot of data and there's a lot of different ways that we present it. You can download these data sets, you can get some information about what we think is important in these data sets. Um, I encourage you all to poke around and explore. Lee, could we go back to the slides, please? Thank you. And if you could go to the next one, great. So just a, a few things to note for the previous one. I think we're out of sync there a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, so a few things to note about health data. Uh, data. Health data are almost always aggregated up to a neighborhood level. Um, these are part of ecological studies, which look at connections between exposure and outcome at a population level, not an individual level. Um, and it's, it's pretty rare that the department publishes uh, individual record level data to protect patient privacy. Secondly, we've got data at many different spatial resolutions. Um, there are data from a wide variety of different sources, different collection methods and whatnot. 
Um, so, you know, we've got data by borough, by UHF 34 and UHF 42 neighborhood boundaries, neighborhood tabulation area, community district, Puma, among others. Um, this can be a little bit confusing. We actually have a data story on there about what all these different neighborhood boundaries are um, and why different data sets are available at each to help provide a little bit of context uh, about, um, about why that's going on. Next slide, please, Lee. So lastly, while I've given you a quick blast through our site uh, as it currently is, we're on the cusp of changing everything. Uh, we're in the midst of a redesign that we think will be a big improvement, especially around our goals of making data easier to access, understand, and use. Uh, and as we head into the final stretches of this, we'd really love to uh, add some of you folks to our email list. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat uh, where you all can do that. Um, we're interested in recruiting people for user testing. We're interested in um, making some announcements about what's to come. So there's a quick little sign up link down there. And again, I'll close by saying that uh, I don't have a GIS background, but my team works to publish data so that it's useful for people like you. Um, so it's really helpful for me to learn what people are interested in accessing and using. So as we get toward the end of our panel, uh, a little bit later on, we get to questions and whatnot. I'll be eager to hear uh, what folks in this session are interested in accessing, uh, learning, using, what your thoughts are, and how we can best serve you. Thanks so much, and I'll pass things on to our next presenter. All right, thank you, Matthew. That was fantastic. Uh, it helps affects all of us, and please uh, tell your friends and colleagues and neighbors about these uh, these tools. So uh, let's go on to city planning, and uh, Matt, take it from here. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Matt Croswell from City Planning. I'm the Open Data Coordinator here. Um, today, I'll be talking mostly about what's new for us uh, in terms of data and tools for 2022. But I do want to mention, you can go, and I'll put it in the chat, um, to our website. And we have our own open data page, which has over 100 different data sets available, which is also on the open data portal. Um, and also on that tab, you can switch over to the Maps and Geography tool. Um, section um, to see a bunch of our tools that are available as well to help you explore the data. Next slide. So the first tool um, that's new for 2022 that will be coming out is the Equitable Development Data Tool or EDDT. Next slide. Uh, this was developed out of the advocacy efforts of Racial Impact Study Coalition or RISC and the public advocate Jumani Williams. They saw a need to have a um, racial equity dis uh, displacement and, and housing affordability um, report uh, added to the ULIP process that we have here at City Planning. And for those that don't know, the ULIP process is the uh, land use application review process for applications that come to City Planning. So that advocacy efforts led to the passing of Local Law 78 in uh, 2021. Uh, which which mandated the creation of this EDDT tool and racial equity reports as part of the EULA process. So the EDDT tool, um, or the it's an interactive tool based on data um, from many different sources and many different agencies uh, to facilitate conversations on housing affordability, racial equity, and displacement. Um, as part of this tool, there's also a displacement risk index, which is a map of neighborhoods that will show the level of risk of being displaced. That's a current snapshot. It's not a forecast or prediction. Um, and these are all based on indicators. Um, some ind indicators included are po poverty level, housing conditions, and rent change. Next slide. The tool itself will have a map, which can select different geography levels. Um, this will be an interactive tool online. Um, and then when you select those um, pieces of the map at a different uh, geography level, you will have data tables avail available to you on uh, many different key data categories, such as demographics, housing production, household economic security, um, and others you can see on the slide. Um, next slide. So this tool will mostly be used for um, the public to better understand factors that might contribute to displacement. It'll support strategies to help New Yorkers stay in their homes and their neighborhoods. Um, and as I mentioned before, one of the main uses of this tool and the data is to facilitate the creation of the mandated racial equity reports. So these reports um, will now require certain ULERP applicants to produce a report to assist the discussion of racial equity during the public review process. 
um, and that will go into effect on June 1st. What triggers the report is if you are a residential applicant, that's going to add 50,000 square feet or more residential um, use, land use, or if you're um, going to increase uh, by 200,000 uh, square feet of non-residential space. Um, the report must include a narrative statement on how to use the on how the land use project relates to the city's goals on fair housing and promote equitable uh, access to opportunity. It'll also include a community profile and then certain data, depending on whether you're residential or non-residential, uh, um, that will have uh, data on market rate for rent, affordable homes and income if you're residential and jobs by sector, medium wages, and then a racial ethnic co a composition uh, if you're non-residential. Next slide. So this project is currently underway. You can see with the arrow, um, there's about to be a public hearing which you can all engage in. So if you have feedback and wanna learn more about what this project is, you can sign up and attend uh, the public hearing that's this Thursday on March 10th from four to seven. Um, the tool is planned to go to be launched on April 1st and the racial equity reports will go into effect as of June 1st. Next slide. If you wanna participate, you can scan this QR code or go to the website listed here there's also an email address for uh, to get in touch with us. And again, you can participate in the public meeting this Thursday, March 10th, by going to nyc.gov slash engage and registering. Next slide. The second tool and data set that we're going to be releasing is the Capital Planning Explorer and the Capital Planning Database. Next slide. So the Capital Planning Explorer is an online resource to help understand um, the capital planning process um, and to tie sort of data and technology into that process, which, was, which has been lacking. Um, the application uses public data and maps to explore data in three separate areas. One is facilities and program sites, another one for new housing developments, and the third and new one is the capital projects plan and plans. Uh, this was originally released in December of 2021 um, as a public release. Prior to that, it was ex existed only for city employees and was only limited to the facilities explorer. Right now, the, the product is in beta um, with improvements targeted for, for this year. Next slide. So each one of those three components is powered by a certain data, uh, open data set that we make available um, on the open data portal. The facilities is, is um, fueled by the facilities database which is uh, thir over 33,000 records of facilities and program sites that are operated or licensed to operate in uh, New York City by a state, uh, city, state, or federal agency. Um, next slide. The housing database was uh, just released for the first time uh, in 2020. Um, so it's a, rare, it's a relatively new uh, data set we have here at City Planning. And it contains all of the DOB applications for new construction alterations and existing of existing buildings and de demolitions for specifically for re uh, residential um, building per permits. Um, next, next slide. And so then the newest um, component to this, which is currently not available on open data, but is available in the capital planning explorer for download is the capital projects database. Um, we will be making this available later in the year uh, from either in late quarter two or early quarter three. Uh, so this will be up on the open data portal. And this um, contains all capital projects uh, with anticipated funding in the next 10 years. It's over 12,000 records, uh, 5,000 which are mappable. Next slide. Uh, so we currently already have, we've had the population fact finder available for several years. Um, but there's been some enhancements to it and go to the next slide, we'll get into those. So this is an online tool that allows users to easily create study errors and choose a pre or choose a predefined geography um, that allow that, that then allows you to explore the census data for New York City. Um, this data is available at several different geography levels uh, from census tract to NTA to community district tabulation area. Um, those last two, NTA and CDTA, are census geographies that are unique to New York City and are created here at City Planning. Um, they allow you to uh, analyze the census data at more of like a neighborhood level or a community district level. 
But the main um, improvement we've made is that they all nest within each other. So the census tracts nest within the NTA and the NTA nests within the community district tabulation area. Prior to this, if you were studying community district data, um, you might have overlaps where the census tracts don't necessarily line up to that community district. So now we have a CDTA area that it lets you do a um, close approximation to that CD, and, and you can nest those from NTA to census tract. You can also use this tool to examine uh, the census and ACS population data for several different characteristics and use it to, to um, compare uh, the data with change over time. Next slide. So the update for this year is that we now have the updated 2020 census data and geographies within the application. Um, this also allows you to compare older census data um, because that 2010 census, um, census data is now mapped to the 2020 uh, census geographies, allowing you to do a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, in this tool, you can also easily create your own study areas by selecting geographies um, and then exporting that data based on your selection and allows you to do several different types of selections. You can also add in your own layer if you have a study area, and that can help you uh, guide uh, selecting your, um, your own custom uh, uh, selections. Next slide. Um, here are, uh, so this slide is just for a lot of the other uh, census resources that city planning makes available. Um, I highly encourage anyone who's doing any type of census analysis within the city of New York to read through these um, very useful uh, resources. Next slide. And our last um, update for 2022 that we'll be discussing is Zap Search Open Data. Next slide. So we have a uh, database here at City Planning called Zap, which is the zoning application portal. Um, this was a major business improvement effort to create a tracking system for the ULERP applications and projects that come through city planning. It's a CRM database that was created in collaboration with Microsoft. And this uh, now that it's at first was uh, just internal, we've now opened it up where applicants can submit applications, pay for fees for the first time directly through this system. Um, and this uh, tracking system currently has approximately over 30,000 projects dating back to the late 70s. Uh, a couple of years ago, our um, digital service, then um, Planning Labs team, uh, created the Zap Search application. And this is a portal that allows the public to explore the projects uh, and the data that's within that Zap application. Um, and you can explore projects that are in the filing all the way through public review stages. Uh, the data that's included in there is, is project specific. There's data on all the applications that are filed the applicants who filed them, and project milestones, um, where, where the project is in the, pro in the, in the review process, as well as uh, project geography. Next slide. Um, so that data that's within there is available to explore through the Zap Search application, but it's currently not available on open data. We are working to get that data up on um, open data now that the internal database is a little bit more stable. Uh, so we're targeting a public release for the end of quarter two or beginning of quarter three this year. Um, the initial release will include the project table that has a lot of the project data as well as a BBL table. We plan to make phased improvements and enhancements over time uh, with additional tables and fields and also uh, available as a spatial file. And it would eventually, the goal hopefully of having an automated daily update uh, directly to uh, the open data portal. But that might be uh, you know, several, several years away. <laughs> Next slide, I think that's, I think, oh, sorry. So uh, these are, I just wanna put this up here for all of the different um, city planning resources uh, we have for uh, regards to open data. Um, the first one is the um, link to our Bytes of the Big Apple, which is our own open data website. Um, there's the DCP tools link, which is not comprehensive at the moment, but we're gonna be working this year to make that more comprehensive and all have all of city planning's applications within that page. Um, there is a link to the planning lab site, which is currently not being updated anymore, but it will, it does still contain a lot of information, especially for developers um, on the code used behind a lot of our applications. 
We have a blog at City Planning for our uh, technology side that's called NYC Planning Digital. We encourage everyone to check out. Uh, we also have a um, DCP ArcGIS online mapping portal, um, which has some of the applications that are based in um, our Esri's ArcGIS online rather than our own applications. Um, and then there's the, our data is available on the NYC Open Data Portal. We have an email that you can email us if you have any questions on any of the open data resources we, or products we provide, you can see here. And just want to give a plug to this audience that we are currently hiring a GIS specialist at City Planning. Um, it's with the GIS team. You can see the job ID here. And if you're interested, you can apply on nyc.gov slash jobs. Wow, thank you, Matt. That's so much uh, fantastic information. I mean, for people who want to make maps and people writing grants in New York City, there's so much great data here. Uh, groups and people doing planning and advocacy, and of course, education. I feel like uh, an entire uh, college course could come out of how to use city planning data and what it means, and the, you know, the demographics and the Capital projects, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, terrific. Uh, so before we go to questions, let's uh, move on and hear from Tom, since many of you probably haven't met him yet. So uh, I don't think I've uh, got uh, uh, slides here, but Tom, uh, you know, take it away and right. tell us about yourself. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks, Thanks for joining everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I am Tom Swanson. I am uh, Executive Director for Citywide GIS here at the Office of Technology and Innovation, OTI, formerly DOIT. And um, I've been here since January 3rd. So um, while I'm new at this position, I'm not new to this type of role. Much of what um, this role in, entails is work that I've been doing um, at the City of Philadelphia for the last seven years. And while the scale of New York is significantly bigger. How a city manages geospatial assets and support of city operations has many commonalities across most large cities. Um, I also assert that GIS's data is foundational in many of the key aspects of city operations, street center lines, tax parcels, buildings, addresses, aerial imagery zoning, just to name a few. I could go on and on about how important GIS geospatial data is to the operation of the city, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Um, and um, since I'm new, um, I may not have a lot of specifics um, on initiatives today. Um, I was just absorbing everything I just saw and just blown away every day. I get to see more new things that are going on and, and um, you know, just always impressive. Um, but you know, kind of given the panel and the topic here, I want to introduce myself, participate. Um, my contact info will be provided at the end, I believe, Lee. Um, if not, I'll make sure that's available. And um, I'm happy to engage uh, so I can learn and understand you know, about the needs and challenges you might have and, and what things that I should know and understand in my role um, to support GIS in the city. Um, also, you know, it's been noted that uh, there's Office of Technology and Innovation, which um, um, has been a merger and, and, and do it is no longer um, uh, effectively um, the organization. And I think with that, there's a lot of um, work that's being done to restructure with a new uh, chief technology officer, uh, Matthew Frazier. Um, I, I think there's going to be some time and it's just going to take a little while to figure out how all that's going to affect everything. And so there's just, um, I think there's, you know, on my end, at least there's some patience of seeing how that goes um, to see impacts. Um, with that, um, uh, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes and talk about some of my experiences and backgrounds that I think will be pertinent. Um, first, uh, it'd be hard to find somebody who's benefited more in their career uh, than myself from open data. So it is open data week. I want to celebrate that and, and recognize how important that is. Um, you know, the first three companies I worked for um, would not have existed without the U.S. Census Bureau um, not sharing out what is called Tiger Line data, which was one of the products that came comes out now with all the decennial um, census data. Um, Tiger Line was the first like national 
street center line data set. So that meant all these companies that I was working for could geocode addresses. So based upon an address, you could look up an XY on, on the earth and you could have a GIS system that um, could give you things like insurance companies rating information. So we were doing what we call now today digital transformation, right? Getting rid of paper-based, inefficient, costly, inaccurate processes and um, being able to utilize geocoding. You know, coming to New York, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing geo support, geo client, how foundational in, in the operation and supporting that type of technology of being able to enter an address or some identifier and finding out information, supporting applications, finding ways people and giving those applications that knowledge of what is the information um, off that location that you want to provide. Um, another example is um, the open data work I've benefited from was the many um, state and um, local government public GIS sharing platforms that started early mid 2000s. Um, and Matt, I had this in my notes before you had it on your slide. And I, you know, call out um, um, the city planning's bites of the big apple. I think it goes way back into the early 2000s uh, when that was established. And um, at the time I was in Minnesota, um, there was a web based application the um, Department of Natural Resources had created in 1999 that allowed for downloading state level data sets for. Um, by specific geographic areas. Um, and then, you know, there's, you wanted to limit how much you could select. It was state level because of bandwidth issues. Um, and um, it was very effective. And that's how I got through most of my grad school work was, was using that platform. Um, but the big reason for mentioning this app was that it had an extensive list of data formats you could choose from when you wanted your output. It also let you pick your spatial uh, projection of the data. Um, this left you know, this is a lasting impression on me in terms of not only the importance of making data available, but making the data available in formats that people need and want to use. And you know now we're you know there, there's a downloading data, but it's even expanded to different types of services and and applications that that would support um, the extensive or spectrum of people that need data in different ways. Uh, fast forward to 2014. I started as Deputy Geographic Information Officer for the City of Philadelphia um, with the central, at the central IT department, which is OIT, not OTI. So that's a lot of fun for me. Um, and eventually I moved out of that role and became a Deputy CIO. Um, a key skill that I learned and was constantly honing was how a central IT group can best support the mission of departments or agencies, they're called here, in their work. Um, it's not easy, but establishing consensus through collaboration is a key part of the process of being successful. Having a community or groups that can be used to communicate with and address common needs is essential. Um, and similar to what I experienced in Philadelphia, there's already a strong community of jazz professionals, leaders in New York City that goes back decades. Um, I'm biased on this but I've always felt that one of the strengths of the GIS communities in general is a predisposition to collaborating and sharing. Um, uh, another specific area that I've been doing a lot of work with is addressing what I call data spaghetti. Um, this is where there are multiple one-off workflows of a single data set, and it's hard to know what is authoritative. Um, this can lead to multiple sources for the same information. They may not match exactly. Over time, workflows for those processes can be unsupported, staff changes, things like that. Um, in general, it's inefficient and creates extra costs to support infrastructure for each of those processes. So I hope to contribute in this role of having standardized, documented, consistent processes for sharing, accessing, sharing and accessing GIS data. Making as much data as possible accessible through the largest audience is a key aspect to that work. Um, I'm also aware though, that at the same time, that it's important to protect, protect sensitive data, data with you know, per personal identifiable information, PII, and other data that falls under some sort of compliance. Um, HIPAA is one that most people are probably familiar with. Um, you know, I have a lot of confidence coming into this role and, and being able to support this, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of time. Um, I think, you know, I just want to stress that engagement with the stakeholders and, and not making it about 
me or the department, but also what, what our real mission is, what the agency's mission is, and, and helping everyone be successful in doing that. So with that, I thank you all for your time and being able to uh, participate today, and I'll hand it back to you. Lee. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom, and welcome, and we're thrilled to have you here. It's, uh, you know, I know you're just getting started, but, you know, hearing what you found valuable and what you found effective and important is um, really helpful for all of us to know, and uh, we're excited to work with you going forward. Um, so let's kind of move it into question modes. I have a couple to get started and it looks like we've got about a half hour in front of us. So I'll ask a couple of questions and then I see there are some uh, questions that people have posted in the chat. So um, uh, why don't we do it that way? I'll read questions from the chat rather than like trying to find people in these squares of about, what do we have, 75 people or so um, in the call today. So. Uh, Bouncing off of what uh, Tom just said, he, he just got here and uh, he's got a new agency and uh, we all have a new boss. We all have a new mayor here. So um, maybe each of our panelists or who would like to, um, you know, want to say a thing or two about how the new mayor is affecting your work. I know for our office, um, we now have a chief climate officer and our office and the Office of Environmental Coordination and the Offices of Resiliency and Climate Change and Sustainability are all now together under Office of uh, Climate and Environmental Justice. So uh, I look forward to more collaboration with our sister offices and um, be able to better integrate environmental justice and climate work into um, remediation and we'll see how that affects our data. So uh, Josh, Matt, Matthew, Jin, uh, wanna wave your hand and tell us a little bit about what you're seeing or anticipating with the new administration? Sure, I can, um, it's, it's pretty early in the administration right now, so um, I think things are going to take a while for us to sort of get an agenda and see what the um, sort of mayor and deputy mayors um, want us to focus on. But um, we're definitely going to be working with them uh, for a healthier and more equitable city. Um, one project that just already was adopted was the open restaurants that we worked with uh, DOT. Uh, so that's keeping the street sheds um, open, uh, which will have effects here at city planning since we used to have uh, sidewalk cafe regulations. Um, so they're kind of being out, phased out in terms of these new regulations. Um, and then we definitely plan on, uh, I'm sure there'll be several initiatives around affordable housing um, and just this um, sort of racial equity within the Euler process. That's fantastic. Great to hear about that. Uh, we have another panelist or two. Yeah, this is Matthew Montesano at Health. You know, I, I know that the that Mayor Adams has expressed interest in um, expanding and improving how how government delivers information using technology, um, which is great, and I think that's vital. But I, I also think that's connected to some really big and difficult issues. You know, touching on uh, procurement within government agencies and the civil service system, right? Like who agencies can hire, how we can spend money. These are big, big challenges. Um, so I think that the mayor, you know, saying he's going to get stuff done um, sounds great. And I, I, I certainly hope that um, technologists working within government will be given resources and priority to continue bringing the city's, you know, digital services into the future um, or into the present. But uh, those are big challenges that I think shouldn't be underestimated. Um, like Matt said, I think that uh, it's early yet and, and we'll need to wait and see what exactly winds up um, being prioritized. Great, thank you. Anyone else on the new mayor? I think, um, we're also in the uh, wait and see. I mean, a lot of our work in emergency management is sort of steady state. The, the emergencies stay despite the administration. So I think a lot um, will remain the same, but just, I mean, not necessarily specific the administration, but Matthew's point, seeing how we can continue to make sure we're keeping up with the needs of the field. You know, one thing that I always run into or we do at our team is we can't 
but it's very difficult to buy data. So we ran into this in COVID. To us, data is just like another resource, like a logistics resource. Um, so maybe with some of the consolidation, you know, that's something that that we can work with our OTI and other colleagues on. Um, you know, how can we in the data and analytics world be positioned to respond to emergencies in the same way we might when folks need water or food or whatever it is. Thank you. That's a that's a really good point. Um, all right, let's move on. My second question I want to throw out there, and uh, Matt alluded to this in his slides, but uh, he's got a position open for uh, you know GIS analyst, which is great. Um, some of the folks on the uh, panel on the, our session here might be studying GIS, thinking about studying GIS, um, studying GIS adjacent fields. So if you could just talk about at your agency, what uh, what skills do you look for in people that you wanna hire? Uh, Jen, I see you popping up. Do you wanna go first on this one? Sure, we're always looking, I mean, it's, uh, uh, are you, are you asking for trends, Lee, about um, what skill sets? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, somebody on the, the call here today is in a GIS program or thinking about, you know, studying something that's going to up their GIS skills that make them more, that your agency would be more interested in hiring them. You know, what do you want to see people be able to do? Um, from my perspective, it's, it's uh, I... I think um, is it Matt that said um, Matt M <laughs> that talked about not being in uh, in GIS world as much. So I think of GIS as part of a, a tool. I <laughs> know I'm using a tool as a uh, skill set, and uh, for me, uh, GIS uh, practitioner should also have a specific background. For for example, EDC. Uh, having having a background in economics and how to build a model is quite important. And I won't talk about the different uh, languages that folks need to know, whether it's Python, Python R, and other um, analytical um, programs. But it is always good to um, position not just the skill set of GIS, but also another discipline how and how to use it in that in that world. So. Great, right. helpful to know. Anyone else on either specific, you know, programming languages, uh, familiarity with particular tools, broader ideas? What What do you look for when you're hiring someone? Yeah, I, I can go next, I guess. Um, so, so a lot of it is, I mean, I think whether it, it's GIS or technology development, um, you know, uh, technology is hard. You, you want somebody who's just tenacious and wants to figure something out and will, you know, Google and Google until you find answers and, and figure it out. Uh, a lot of it is those, those types of skills, regardless of what it is, um, is so key. Um, you know, specifically, uh, you know, in GIS, I, I'm, I would stress Python um, um, for somebody from a development standpoint. Um, that's pretty much a lot of what, what has been standardized there. Um, I also think it's just, you know, in terms of how cities operate in every city and county in the country, um, that there is, there's, there is a foundation of, you know, some of the ESRI technology that's used that, that kind of permeates a lot of things and, and those, those, the community around that. That, that just it just it just kind of is in, in in local government one of the, the key technologies um, that that you're, we're going to be we look for when we're hiring and that was you know here in here in this role and and in Philadelphia it was it was a, a key um, skill to have. Thank you, Josh. You want to go next? Sure. Um, I mean, I would say you know Python, any kind of coding chops these days. I think it's very helpful. Um, you know, when I'm hiring folks, I, I think people, number one, I think you, you got to kind of love what you do. I think of myself as a geo geek. I think, you know, physically working for the city or, you know, not being in the private sector, it's, it's helpful if you are inspired by this type of work. Um, I think, you know, if anything else, just being, and, and Tom references, you know, being willing and having the skills to pick up new technologies, new skills. Um, and I would say this is a little bit general, maybe, but just having a good foundation 
of geospatial best practices, how to work with data. Because when I've, you know, I came out of undergrad in 2000, um, and I was trained as a desktop JS person, I think, and I got most of, I was in a good program, I got most of the universe. The coding was done by other people, IT ran the servers, and I knew ArcInfo and ArcMap and a little command line, and I could do everything. Now, you know, graphic design, big data programming, you know, we do it all in the field. So those, I think, looking to get in, you're never going to become an expert in all of that. But when I look, you know, if you're going to be a good teammate, if you can, you know, dive in and learn things and then have, you know, some basic programming and geospatial knowledge, I think, I think that's it. Um, but I'm curious, you know, if folks have thoughts. I, as I watch the field, there are so many specialties now. I think that it's changed, you know, what it means to be a GS professional is changing over time. So it is, if you find it's hard to keep up, I think it is. That's great. It sounds like it's becoming more multidisciplinary, which, you know, reaches out and, and brings in more people. So, uh, Matt, you're looking to hire somebody right now uh you know what is it going to take them to you know win the position or you know looking forward we don't obviously we don't know about the budget yet for next year but uh you know what what does it take for people to join your team yeah uh, so the the position we have specifically open right now uh, we're definitely looking for someone with uh, data management and skills uh so this this um position is within the gis team Team. Um, so this is more of like, you know, sort of what, what I do, which is maintain um, the internal spatial data house, the uh, data warehouse uh, for our internal users, provide technical assistance. Um, so people with data management skills, um, we also help people uh, out with their analysis. So data analysis, visualization, um, and just, you know, someone, you know, who's uh, organized, good communicator, um, strong research, analytical, organizational skills. Those are all things we're looking for. I want to echo what uh, Josh was saying. Um, you know, a lot of times people get into GIS and they think it's very, you know, sexy with like 3D data, building web applications. But a lot of times the things that are really, truly helpful is just writing good metadata, <laughs> knowing, you know, helping users who, who are using that data and helping them be able to use that data more effectively. Um, and understand, be able to understand that data, its limitations, um, things like that. Um, but not to say, so the position we do have here is with the JS team, and it's more of a data management um, position, but city planning in general um, is very broad in the disciplines we have within GIS. I mean, we have a transportation division, an environmental review division, a population division, housing and economics. So it really crosses a lot of over a lot of um, different disciplines that you can use GIS in. Um, so each one of those divisions probably has their own one or two um, GIS analysts. Um, and on top of that, we also have within our um, ITD de uh, department, we have data engineers. We have a team building at web applications. I have designers, uh, product managers, um, QA analysts, uh, software engineers. So all of these things can touch into to GIS. And so just um, keep monitoring our, um, our website and nyc.gov slash jobs to see what's uh, available, not only at city planning, but uh, the whole city. That's great. Thanks, Matt. And before we go to audience questions, Matthew, you anything you want to add? You don't have a GIS background, but here you are <laughs> on the city agency GIS panel. Yeah, you know, especially after hearing Matt's comment that um, sometimes writing uh, good documentation is worth more than writing good code. I I'm paraphrasing a little bit, um, but I thought that was really interesting. So I wanted to provide a perspective on um, being a technology worker in government. And I think that one thing that's worth pointing out about uh, working for a government agency and working uh, with technology is there's often a challenge of producing work that doesn't increase your agency's technical debt. Um, a bleeding edge, solu edge solution might not be durable. It might not last any longer than your tenure in that position. It might be more trouble than it's worth when you leave. Um, a bike mechanic I used to know uh, used to say that a good mechanic makes the next mechanic's job easier. And I think it's really similar working in civic technology. Um, we try and write you know, clean code that's very maintainable and uses conventional tools. Uh, sometimes we look for the simple solution. So that slogan in tech, uh, move fast and break stuff, well, within government, it really needs to change to you know, like move deliberately and fix stuff. 
So I think that attitude is very helpful for getting a job um, in a public agency where you're thinking critically about uh, the right tool for the job and what is going to make the next person's job easier. Thanks. That's a really important perspective. You know, we, we're all working with the, you know, the public's money and the public's resources, and we've got to, you know, be mindful of that. We can't just break everything. Um, great. Thank you all for these perspectives. Let me take my eyes here to the chat and, you know, we'll go through quickly the questions. If I'm missing anything, um, let me know. Let's see. Is health data provided at census tract level? Matthew? Sometimes. Um, I, I sort of in, got at this a little bit in a response a little bit later on in the chat, but you know, a lot of health conditions are not very common. And so in order to um, get enough numbers to provide uh, reliable rates or estimates, it's necessary to aggregate up either spatially or temporally. Um, so it, it tends to be a little bit rare that health data are provided at census tract level um, with things that are more common uh, it can be done at um, NTA. Uh, COVID data are provided at the modified zip code tabulation area, um, but often we're aggregating a little bit uh, more roughly, you know, up to UHF 42 or community districts. Um, one thing we note that, you know, even when things are provided at a finer spatial resolution, the spatial patterns are the same, um, which is that for the most part in New York City, uh, given, you know, its history um, and its segregation inequality uh, that the, the worst health effects of almost anything are experienced um, in neighborhoods with lowest incomes. Thanks, this is a related question. Will you be updating neighborhood level data to match the new NTAs from city planning based on the 2020 census? Yeah, I know that there's a lot of work going on to, uh, to update things um, given the 2020 census. I, I don't know what the time frame is for that, but I'm, I'm sure that's underway at some level of the agency. Okay, let's see. We got a, some back and forth here about the RAT info portal. I see you were responding uh, just for people who haven't been following it. You wanna respond to this question about the RAT portal? Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, I did mention that some of the, the, uh, the data that the department makes available is, you know, inspectional and operational data. Uh, and so, the link I provided, you can see um, the results of rat inspections in your neighborhood in case you want to be either reassured or grossed out. Depends. <laughs> All right. We uh, take our data with uh, fortitude here. Uh, let's see. Right, uh, is there a difference between the CDC's national health data and the city's local health data? How accurate is CDC's national data on the census yeah. level? Yeah, that it really depends on the source. That's a sort of pretty pretty broad question. Um, sometimes we're working off of the same data source. Sometimes different data sources. Um, it's a it's a very broad question. That's a little bit hard to answer at that resolution. Okay. All right. Let's take the heat off Matthew for the moment and. Um, <laughs> M. Richardson is asking a general question about the data set for building footprints. They have issues with this data set when a column multi-polygon will change to data point, which has disastrous implications. So open data say it doesn't help. Uh, da, 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 da. So the building footprint data, is that city planning or is that finance? Who's got the building footprint data and you have any thoughts about this question? Yeah, I think um, uh, I'm just reading right here. Uh, so, so I think the answer is um, I, I can connect you with Chris Rado. He, he's he's so he was just I was just pinging him. Um, but there is a specific. There are two different endpoints, and I think one of them um, might be the better one in this case. So, um, I don't um, I don't know sure where this question is coming from. Um, but at least on my end, obviously I'm new here and I'm just struggling through that. But um, I do know Chris Rado is a person, um, talk to him, he could probably help you out. Terrific, I'm gonna close with a slide that has all of our uh, email addresses on it. So if you need to get in touch with someone, um, you can take it from there. I just can't do it at the same time that I'm looking at the chat questions. 
Uh, Steve Romolowski is given a thumbs up for open data and data transparency. And it's interesting as I'm listening to all of us talk, um, you know, I've been doing this for 20 plus years and previous, there was so much, I mean, obviously there's still data that's not appropriate to share with the public, you know, for security purposes and whatnot, but so much data that we deal with every day, the default is to share it. And it's really terrific. Gets more people engaged. Um, anybody have any comments on data transparency and, you know, how you feeling about it? Everyone in favor? Yeah, good. Oh, great here. Let's see. Yeah, I think Mike, we're headed in a good direction where we've been increasing open data over the past several years. I think that's the way the whole city's uh, going. Great. Uh, Mike Wiley also given a thumbs up on uh, equity and data transparency. Why does the health department use UHF areas which are based on zip code? Is that just a historic interest question or uh, Matthew, you have any insight into the current utility of UHF data? I do, yeah. So, you know, uh, these UHF 42 neighborhood boundaries are uh, sort of definitely a little bit of a confusing neighborhood scheme. Um, but this, this geography was created by the health department and the United Hospital Fund uh, about 40 years ago, I want to say. Um, and they were designed for health research to be roughly similar to community districts. So health data often includes a person's zip code. It's one of the most readily available pieces of geographic information and administrative data. Uh, it can persist even when those data are de-identified. Um, it's also a neighborhood designation that most people know and can provide when responding to a survey. So um, UHFs are rolled up uh, zip codes. Um, so they wind up being a neighborhood scheme that uses that piece of readily available information. Um, for a long time, the department has based its annual surveys like the community health survey uh, on UHF neighborhoods so that as it uh, samples New Yorkers, it can uh, get a representative sample uh, from each neighborhood, so neighborhoods can be compared with high statistical significance. Um, you know, this this neighborhood scheme is sort of has has become part of the infrastructure of uh, of collecting these data. And while it can be a sort of confusing um, or opaque scheme, um, there's some value behind it. I hope that's a useful answer. Very good. Uh, we've got a college student doing a uh, project using 311 noise complaint data and wants to know if there are any city data sets collecting qualitative and quantitative data on quality of life. Anyone aware of where they should look in addition to 311? Generally, I would just say go to NYC Open Data, the portal. And whichever sort of topic you're looking for, you know, do your searches there. You know, I'm sure there's police, um, MIPD's got some crime statistics, um, but depending on which, you know, uh, area of quality of life you're looking at, um, I would do some searches on uh, the open data portal. Yeah, that sounds about right. I think if people have, uh, agencies have data on that, um, that's where it would be found. Um, back to Matthew, a former colleague is looking for information on uh, guidance on censoring small cells for data privacy and wants to know if you've got any reference documentation they should look at. Mm, yeah, I took a look at this question. Unfortunately, I don't have any reference docs. I feel like I, I've seen a number of different um, work groups do things in different ways. Um, for their own reasons, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure I can provide guidance there. Apologies, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Let's see, we've got the, the open data team uh, putting up their uh, information about how to engage with them, and some people responding to questions with resources. And okay, more comments about 
zip codes. Um, okay, we just have a couple minutes left. Is there uh, any further questions? Anyone wants to get in at the last minute or any final remarks from anyone on the panel that uh, you wanted to say earlier and just remembered? All right, well, let me share that slide with the, uh, um, the emails. Whoops, oh, there we go. We're at the end, come on. There we are. Um, so yeah, please make a note of that. Um, reach out with any follow-up questions. Uh, people mentioned uh, resources or other people you need to get in touch. Again, this slide deck we will share with everybody who registered. So um, I will get that to you as soon as I get the list from the Open Data team. Uh, finally, I wanna thank everybody for your interest in attending today and for your questions and for your support of civic tech and city agencies and GIS and um, Oh, my last question to Jin was, is there an upcoming gizmo meeting or event that everybody should come to? We'll close on that. Yes, I think we're collaborating with uh, probably the OIT, uh, OTI team, hopefully. And also we will have a uh, new uh, looking to uh, bring forth some tech uh, innovation in GIS on uh, voice notes. And so AI into, uh, into the world of GIS as well. So um, check out GIS, I mean, gizmonyc.org for the calendar of events coming up. Thank you for giving me light. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, well, thank uh, all the presenters for everything you put into uh, creating this presentation today and uh, Good luck with everything for uh, this spring-like day and the season and the year to come. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lee. And thanks Open Data Week for hosting us. <laughs>